Welcome to episode number 12 of um, What Sex Got to Do With It, and we have here the author, Heather Remoff, who is my uh, favorite 84-year-old great-grandmother uh, <laughs> in the whole Western Hemisphere. <laughs> so, so, so. Uh, Len, I, it's good there aren't too many chapters. You'd run out of excess. We don't have too many chapters more. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll, you'll be surprised. You know. But anyways, this chapter 11 is called Painting by Numbers. You know, and, and we kind of ended the, you know, on chapter 10 saying that you know, this was coming. So you want to tell us a little bit about um, why it's called Painting by Numbers? Because Darwinian theories of evolution are very, very dependent on numbers of offspring. He was convinced that the most successful members of the species would have the most offspring. Uh, I happen to believe that he was wrong in that. But there, in terms of evolutionary theorists, there's been reproductive success has been calculated by how many offspring there are. Now, of course, Darwin did argue that the individuals who were best adapted to whatever change there might have been in the environment, they were the most fit and would therefore have the most children. But his measure of success was always numbers of offspring, and I'm saying particularly in humans. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's not accurate. Gotcha. And yet, when I did the research that inspired me to work in this field, I believed that. I went into it with the absolute assumption that the women I interviewed, when they described men as successful, those men that were described as successful would have the greatest number of offspring. And I was shocked to find out that wasn't true. And I also went into it believing, because I asked women about all kinds of things, uh, and then correlated the traits they ascribed to a man to their behavior with the man. Right. I assumed women would be careless users of birth control right. when they met men that that they wanted to father their children, and that was not true at all. Right. So, you know, two Darwinian assumptions sort of smacked me in my right. face, and right. because I believed that, I'd been very careful at how I structured right. my, my right, right. Um, experimental design. Right. I right. was really surprised when it was, n when the outcome was not what Darwin and I predicted. Right, 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 right. So, um, the I trust your research course. You know, one question just popped into my head now is, is I'm, I'm thinking about me, um, sperm donors. Oh, this really does change things, Len. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been oh, doing oh, it for very, a while. Oh, yeah, they've now, been doing it for a while. But now you can find out. You know, yeah, I, uh, and, and it's become more popular. And Does that the, change? Oh, the whole sperm donor thing does change things quite a bit. Yeah. First of all, it actually exaggerates kind of the innate differences between men and women, and one of which is two different um, ways to approach reproductive behavior. Women invest heavily in a very few children. You know, biologically, men could have a whole lot of children. I mean, they could spire 20 children right. or sire uh, 20 children at once. Once a woman's pregnant, she's got. Right. It, one, maybe two, right. you know, it makes headlines if it gets to be too many more right. than two. And her whole reproductive um, machinery is tied up. Right. And, you know, men, meanwhile. So sperm donors really exaggerated that. And in fact, there was recently an article oh, a couple of years ago, maybe, about this generous man who was offering to donate sperm to women who wanted to be pregnant without a charge. Of course, you know, sperm banks do charge. And I thought to myself, Mm, that's not really generous. <laughs> All he's given is his sperm, and he's getting a lot of reproductive success out of that. Right. An awful lot of will women, I forget how, oh, a lot, he had a lot of children, are having, enduring the rigors of pregnancy, the damage to their bodies, the changes to their bodies, um, the lifelong investment in children, and he's skating away. He's not helping to raise them. He's not picking up the college tuition bills. So, yes, yeah, sperm donors, oh, that really, really changes it. But, but does that change, like, the, the nature of, of the, the type of person that he um, has, he, um, that reproduces? Because you were saying that, to your surprise, me, the wealthier men don't, you know, and so. 
No, oh. I, in terms of the, well, women certainly, when they're viewing those sperm donor profiles in right. a legitimate sperm bank, in, in uh, opposition to this man who just was right. generously going to donate his sperm to anybody who wanted it, in a, in a you know, licensed sperm bank, men list profiles, their college right. degrees, right. Their, they have photographs, right. their, you know, athletic interests. So women are still selecting for the traits that make men attractive. Right. But the difference is that one man now can really do that biological imperative of having a whole lot of children. Right, right. But what I'm getting at is, so now, given that they look at the profiles, I mean, or do you feel that that might kind of skew the results that you have noted that, I mean, the wealthier men don't tend to have as many children? Not really, because yeah. like in cultures, um, in cultures, for example, where men might have a harem, <laughs> or in some religious uh, groups, where one man has lots of wives, there, you know, men are having more children than women, but the traits that women select for, like the women who are willing to be in a harem of a powerful man, if he were not a powerful man, I don't think they'd be willing to be in that harem. Right. So, so um, the individual woman, though, the individual woman has, and, and the couple, you know, we're mostly a pair bonding uh, species. I think Dan Savage, the the uh, sort of the sex uh, right, yeah. guru, he describes humans as being monogamish. Right. And we are monogamish, so we're mostly pair bonded species. Right. And a, a, a pair that has reliable control of resources. You know, again, biology is destiny, not statistical. Or yeah. It is not destiny, but is statistical probability. Most families who have reliable control of resources don't have very many children. Right, right, right. right. It's that old adage, uh, what is it, um, the rich get rich and the poor get right. children. Right, right, right. Yeah, we certainly discussed that. Yeah. You know, I think it was when we dealt with Chapter 10. See, so, so now we're really thinking, focusing a bit on... Um, um, wealth inequality, I mean, and, and this chapter talks a lot about wealth accumulation. I mean, so, so you, do you think that wealth accumulation would be okay if those with wealth did more good with it or did good no. things with it? No, I, I, I think that's so arrogant. I, I'm not impressed by the philanthropy right. of extremely wealthy people. Um, the Bill Gateses, the, the Jeff, well, uh, the Jeff Bezoses, the Elon Musks. Elon Musk is kind of proud of not being too, too philanthropic. Right. But to me, that's so arrogant to assume you know what other people need and want. Let's let everybody have enough control of resources that they can they can direct their own lives and decide what's important to them. I mean, yes, certainly Carnegie with his libraries, that's all very lovely. And I'm glad somebody did it. And, and um, so wealth can accomplish good things, and I'm very appreciative when I go to libraries. You know, I'm very grateful. Um, or co various concert halls. I mean, the wealthy do subsidize right. the arts. So I'm grateful for that. But um, it sort of enables them to turn a blind eye to what the extreme accumulation of their wealth has has inflicted on other people. Right, right, right. I, you know, I, I talk, I think, in the chapter on language about how good our brain is at tricking ourselves. Right. And, and so, yeah, I, but I'm a little more extreme than most people, and I don't talk too much about my strong, the kind of answer I've just given you. I'm not quite that blunt in the book, but yeah, I, I would like an egalitarian society to start with, so we don't need someone to rush in and rescue. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I hear you. So 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 egalitarian is 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 pretty much saying that people have about the same, right? Or have 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 the ability to have the same. Right. Not everybody would want the same. Right. You know, I I I have a very sweet life. I mean, obviously, right. anybody who lives in Arlington has a very sweet life. Right. So I'm not saying that I'm economically deprived. Right. But. I'm I'm very happy without too many possessions. Right. I find possessions to be extremely burdensome. Right. That's not true for everybody, right. but we certainly have far more than we need. Well, I, I, when I was once uh, 
politically active, and because I'm a writer, I was asked to to host a letter a letter writing campaign in my home to help other political activists kind of master writing letters to the editor. I was so delightfully charmed and amused, but I think it's such a funny thing to say to someone. A woman I'd never met walked into my condo, looked around and said, oh my goodness, it doesn't look like you bought any of your furniture at the same time. Right. And I, I didn't. Most of my furniture has kind of been handed down. Somebody died who right. wants the bed. You know, I have my, my great-grandmother's bed, you know, things that have been handed down. So, you know, I'm very comfortable living that way. Right. I, uh, but not everybody is. But, you know, we, and even I have far more than I need. As I'm approaching the end of my life, right. I look at the stuff, just the accumulation of stuff. Right. Think, I could have done without almost all of this. Right. And when I die, it's just going to be a burden for someone to give it away. But as a species, we overaccumulate. We all do. Right, right. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is, is the, do you feel that the, there is a threshold I mean, for which we should aim I mean, for people to have either yearly or, or over their lives? I mean, uh, and as long as you have reached that threshold, then it's okay to have inequality? I, well, I think there's always going to be a measure of inequality. But I mean, like inequality, like, I mean, like really... Let's just say um, wide disparities. Between I, I, I'm very much against the wide disparities. I always, you, and I don't think wide disparities would be possible if we outlawed the kind of monopoly that enables those. The, and when I say outlawed, just make people pay. I'm particularly, and we'll get to this yeah. more in the later chapters, right. but I'm particularly concerned about how the ownership of naturally occurring right. resources enables some people to exclude others from the very things that they need in order to live at all. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm, and in terms of you're like thinking a, a citizen's dividend or a min, minimum annual income, I'd be in favor of that I, as long as it was funded by the collection of resource rents right. uh, from the people who control the commons in nature who claim ownership to the commons in nature as long as they were charged the resource rents that accrue to those right. who control resources that others need right. then i think that would be a, a good you know to yeah. to pay a you know there's talk of every child that gets born maybe born with a certain account and, and right. i'd be in favor of some of that kind of thing right we'll definitely get to the resource yeah. rent uh i think if not in the next chapter the chapter after that and uh, uh so so let me bounce this idea off your, off of you, because because part of me is like, how do we get from here to there in, mm. in a way that you know, um, um, is is politically palatable? You know? mm. uh, 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 and so this is maybe a little bit not so much the case. You know, I mean, we'll come back to me maybe what I was thinking about earlier about a threshold and then having mm -hmm. inequality over that. What do you think of this notion that you can earn as much as you want? However, you earn it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, or you can I mean, accumulate I mean, um, as much money I mean, in a given year um, as as you can. But then you have to you have to spend it all, you know, in <laughs> in one or two years. I mean, you can put maybe a small mm -hmm. amount aside, I mean, for retirement all, but it kind of gets the money back in the economy. So it kind of stops you from accumulating at least the money. You can still accumulate things, but but my thinking is that if you buy something, you have to pay someone for it, and that money gets into the I, accounting. I, um, I'm not, you know, I love these discussions because yeah. it forces me to think about things. It's the, one of the really great things about writing a book. I get to talk to people, right. and every time I do, I get new ideas. This is an idea I'm not thrilled with, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because I'm very concerned about overconsumption. Yeah. And so you're forcing people to buy things. Right. You're encouraging a growth economy, and I'm not sure growth that kind of growth economy is sustainable. And so this consumption, in fact, the one thing that I have really liked about the supply chain issues we have going on now, I think it teaches people, hey, we don't need instant gratification on all things. You go to the store looking for a particular item and they don't have it, and you think, you know what, I can probably live without that. 
to me that's great training for us to realize we don't need to have everything we what happens because we evolved we're an evolved species and when a species that's shaped by evolution does something that contributes to its survival there's a release of dopamine so you get that dopamine rush so for example early hunter gatherers they find berries and they're picking them and that that gives them that dopamine rush but what we've we get that same rush now when we purchase something but it's not that we're just finding something that we need to eat to sustain us you know we've taken it to extremes it's out of control so again because it triggers uh it triggers a, a metabolic reaction that's reinforcing behavior that people need to eat. When I say, or you know, we need to eat to live, when I say humans, the human brain has been shaped to, um, f for two purposes, um, survival and reproduction. And survival, of course, is finding enough to eat, so, and, and, and think a place to be housed. But because of our symbolic control of language, you know, because we have language, we define what we need if far in excess of what we want. One of the economists that I admire has an expression about uh, when, when you're asking about people can earn as much as they want as long as they have to buy, spend it. His, his little slogan is, um, pay for what you take, not for what you make. So he would eliminate all taxes on income and, and that way people could keep what they earn, but they'd have to pay for what they've taken from the commons in nature. So then they wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't earn as much. So that's the slogan that I favor, you know. Gotcha, yeah, so, so, um, so at this point, I mean, I'm going to just dip into some evolutionary stuff maybe yeah. for a little bit and, and, and maybe I might borrow something from uh, an oncoming chapter, an upcoming cha chapter, you know, so, so, um, with respect to evolution, and you and, and, uh, were referring to Stephen Jay Gould's I mean, and his notion of punctuated equilibria, and that he could see st stable, um, sp a stable set of species I mean, uh, for tens millions of years. I mean, um, uh, but then you have these periods of rapid mm -hmm. I mean, um, evolution that could spawn a new species in 5,000 you know, to, to 50,000 years. Uh, do you, think you, can, do you think it can be even less time than that? Oh, absolutely, I um. do. I mean, in the early chapters of my book, you know, the, for example, uh, the change in, what was it, the, the snail kite, that, yeah. that Florida species of bird, they evolved larger beaks in just a matter of a few generations when the species of snail on which they'd been dining was suddenly threatened by a, a larger snail that was taking over their... Um, the ecosystem, and it was in just a couple generations, but that's sexual selection that drove right. that. Right, and that, that was rapid. a new species within? Uh, well, it, it was not a new species, I mean, that's what I was again, um, Len, I, we, our definition of species is not, not real sound. I, I, I quibble with it. What is a species? I, I actually heard an interview, someone interviewing Franz de Waal, asking, um, well, are, they, are you know, are orangutans and chimpanzees are they different species would they be subspecies my definition and this is not universally accepted I think a species has the same number of chromosome pairs so we're definitely a different species from chimpanzees with our 23 chromosome uh -huh. pairs and they have 24 but the great apes all have 24 chromosome pairs so I would be more inclined to consider them subspecies now um, we did, you know, there, Darwin and those finches, we call them different species of finches. I, uh, that doesn't work fully for me. I, I, you know, humans have imposed a definition of species on an animal world that doesn't always neatly match. Um, because some species don't breed with each other, even though they have the same number of chromosome pairs. You know, they may have been evolving or living in different areas long enough that they have different coloration, different bird song, and those can be barriers to being a reproducing pair, but they're barriers that can be overcome in the case of scarcity. Yeah. And in the early chapters I talked about, you know, the, 
supposedly new species of finch on the Galapagos Islands. Um, it came from a result of two other species, <laughs> existing species, breeding with each other and producing offspring that have a population that mates within itself. But should there no, be no available uh, birds of that particular type, I forget what they called them, big bird or something, they, they'll, they'll mate within what I call a species, but not everyone would. So right. I once heard some mycologists, uh, I went on, a, my daughter is an amateur mycologist, and we went on a mushroom walk, and it's one of those wonderful things where they spread out tables and everybody comes back and puts the various uh, fungi that they found on a table, and the experts are identifying them, and they were talking about different species, and I asked the question around species, and the two gentlemen who were doing the explaining, they looked at each other and they laughed, and they said, are you perhaps indicating that the human knows that the animal world and the, the you know the living plant world does not necessarily behave in a way that corresponds to the human definition of species and uh, clearly that they that's what they believed and oh. that's what I believe also. Oh. I thought species. I thought the definition. I thought what separated species was the ability to produce star, produce progeny that mm -hmm. could. Yeah. Reproduce. And, and I, I go with that. I would yeah. agree with you. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, I forget the, the species of fish, and I heard a woman speak at the Radcliffe Institute about how quickly different species within that species of fish evolved. And I asked her, but if you took the individuals from what you're calling different species back into the lab and put them together, would they and could they mate with each other? And she said, oh, sure. Right. So to me, yeah, the, species, yeah, yeah then to me that, it's, but, yeah, so, right. but, but again, right. uh, the, we don't have, I don't think we have a, I wish we had a more precise definition of species, but yeah. I don't think we do. Interesting, okay. Well, I guess for now then, I'll, I'll just kind of stick with me, the ability to have progeny that can, can reproduce, you know, so okay. You know, uh, so, and, and just <laughs> something, maybe I, I could look this up on my own, you know, uh, but you talk about the whale uh, and, and elephants, you know, and, and th so are whales closely related to elephants? In, Len, I'm not, I'm not qualified to give a good answer okay. on this, but the information in my book in which I'm discussing whales and elephants, I had not realized that whales kind of came out of the ocean and elephants evolved from them. And then when ele when they got so big that they their legs really couldn't support the weight on land, back into the ocean and whales. So yeah, I think ele elephants, well, of course, whales are a mammal. So I think elephants and whales are probably pretty closely related. But there was a, I forget the title of the book that the science book Club read on whales, and that's where I got that aha moment. Um, so, so the whales came out of the ocean, became elephants. Well, I mean, I don't think it was quite, you know, quite that obvious. But in fact, yeah, there was a movement out of the ocean onto land, and then the very heavy size made it hard because whales weigh more than the largest dinosaurs. Right. Right. The very heavy size made it difficult, like to be mobile on land. You know, how can legs support that much right. weight? And so it be, you know, back into the ocean. So, the, but I'm not the expert on that. Okay. And, right. uh, but the, I love those kinds of, I love picking up little bits of information from people who are the experts. Yeah, and that's what makes me, reading your book, be so enjoyable and why I'm having a lot of fun just talking with you a lot about it because you do have these little tidbits of information. So I was really trying to get the kids, like I said, I mean, I did, when I did evolution and population, I was really like evolution genetics. It was really on the, on the small scale, I mean, mm -hmm. with fruit flies and then, I mean, then mostly DNA sequencing. And, and, and I hate to tell people to a certain extent that I did population evolution genetics because they would probably expect me to be able to tell you like how close the related species are. And it's like, that wasn't part of what I studied. I mean, I wasn't particularly interested in it, you know, uh, I mean, intellectually so, but not enough to really like uh, study and absorb it. I mean, so that's why when you like said that elephants and whales were closely related, it's like, are they really? You know, and so. And, and Lynn, uh, this is what is so much fun to me. You know, I, I probably mentioned that there's some phrases that my family doesn't like to hear me mention because I talk about it so much. One is referring to humans in which I say we are not a pretty species, 
But in fact, one of the things I really love about it is that our language has made possible. Our language is the double-edged sword. It's made some great things possible and some awful things possible. One of the wonderful things it's made possible is the accumulation of knowledge in a single individual. Like, I don't have to know everything about elephants and whales to get an insight from someone who does. And, and that's, that to me is, is just fabulous. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree. So, so uh, you know, uh, it, I thought that we might get out of this chapter <laughs> a little early. It, I thought it might be actually earlier than this, so I was going to maybe go back to uh, another chapter. But we have about three minutes now, and so, so you, you mentioned me that if you remove one thread, and the whole web of life is at risk, you know? And, and I know that that is, to a certain extent, a metaphor for me. But how many, what's your sense of how many species there are in oh, a Oh, there are trillions of species. Honestly, no, but, but when you say a threat, I mean, so, I mean, certainly we have extinctions going on all the time, even before humans became a part. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so, so we could probably lose a species or two, you know, and not have the whole web but you know. the thing is, if you start at what we might call the bottom of the food chain, yeah. uh, problems there escalate yeah. up through the food chain pretty right. quickly. E.O. Wilson, I forget the exact number of years, he said if, if humans died off the planet in, I forget how many thousands of years, you know, the planet would be fine, we'd be gone. But you remove insects, all insects, from the population, and everything gets yeah. wiped out. Yeah. I mean, there. Right, but that's a lot of species, though. Yeah, well, I think there's been a 40 percent reduction, uh, extinction rate of insects in the last decade. Yeah, no, that's no. a large number. Yeah, no, no. You know, I'm not saying are, are you, you're not old enough, probably, to remember the days when you went for a drive in the summer and you had to keep stopping to clean the insects off yeah. your windshield. Nobody has to do that anymore. Yeah. So Nobody not, has to do yeah. that. I grew up seeing yellow splots all over right, the windshield. Right. Almost never does an insect yeah. get smashed on a yeah. windshield. Certainly not disputing me that we lost a lot of species. I, mean, I was just trying to get a sense of I mean, uh, how many I mean, species you think I mean, uh, we could maybe tolerate. You know, so, so before, I mean, like so essentially I was thinking like how many species there are in a thread. And I know it depends on the, the type of species mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. it's located. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so that's where I was hoping to take the conversation. But you know what? Maybe we can take it there when we cover the next chapter, you know, which is going to be called The Economics of Desire. And so <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> Heather. A, and I'm looking forward fun, to man. talking to you uh, on chapter 12. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.